El timo satanas cras rex recitio altere. Almighty Satan, great ruler of the universe. Edit al strenium bupi dislerie untu bistizio. Foot upon thy throne, and eye of the serpent ever seeing. Castio upi es nubio des lels un sano, et vio respusio con sapiae. Cast upon us now thy light and wisdom as we intertwine with thee. Un maduo rexiore ine con utrexio parasta un vivio tamande elechuet, excelsio satanas. And may your kingdom reign with never-ending praise as we all say, Hail Satan. Satan. We three servants, thy intertwined priests, come to thy throne. May those that are yours only hear thy voice. Ave Satanas. Ave Satanas. To our studio audience, Welcome this evening. This is Mel Thorpe Draco coming to you from Studio 3B, and this is Night Sessions. We have another impactful show for you tonight, and back with us again is our co-host, Magister Cygnus Atratus, and of course, Magus Alistair Knott. Alistair, tell us about the focus of our show. Thanks, Mel Thorpe. This evening, we're going to delve into the selection and establishment of the Satanic Altar. We're going to talk about the altar implements or tools that are part of the satanic practice. And we're going to discuss our own personal practices. As a reminder, as we said in our most recent episodes, your satanic journey is highly individual. And the same can be said of your ritual practice. We will approach this segment as priests discussing what has become important in our practices. Listeners, feel free to try what we present here if you find it of value. Use it as your own and put the rest away for another day. We'll end our discussion this evening with some tips for writing your own rituals or, as we say, building your individual journey onto the astral plane. So that's our show for tonight. Really excited about it. We'll try to get all of this done in one dark evening. But before we go there, let's go to the one who brought us here. Father Satanas, we ask for your guidance tonight as we discuss these topics. Bless the listeners and touch their spirits with your eternal black flame. We ask for your blessings for each and every member of your satanic kingdom, those within and those without, those who are searching, those facing persecution, and those who are fighting a spiritual warfare, even as we speak these words. Bases of unhallowed ground and tilled soil, of cold water and hot oil, of tincture perfection and satanic healing for your forthcoming covenant unsealing. Those above and those below your satanic blessings to bestow. As we walk through the fire victorious, we give you the satanic glory. So mote it be, Nema. So how is everyone doing tonight? Hey, Alistair, this is Mount Thorpe. You know, I just have to say the last show that we did was really very impactful for me. I don't know how you guys felt, but man, Satan really showed up and was there in a very tangible and real way. I feel like, you know, in a way that we've not felt before. Um, you know, we'd only done two other shows before that, but I really love doing this with you guys. And I hope that you're getting the same out of it that I am. And I hope our listeners are too. Oh, absolutely. I feel the same way. 
I truly feel his presence in what we're doing, what we're saying. And especially after listening to it a week or so later, it's just as powerful. And in fact, in some ways for me, it brings out the nuances of things that I missed because we were recording it. Yeah, that's really good. Hi, everybody. This is uh, Cygnus here. Uh, this has really been a dark blessing and um, so nice to to see it unveiled, you know, mysteriously kind of on its own, you know, in the hand of Satanas there. And so it's I'm also in, in awe of this beautiful um, gift that we're here coming together for. So thank you for having me here. And it's a pleasure and satanic blessings. Malthor, back to you for our questions this evening. Thanks, Alistair. So let's let's talk about the selection of our temple, which will contain Satan's altar. Alistair, explain to our novices, what's the purpose of a temple and his altar and an element maybe or two that are important in the selection process? The purpose is really a place of communication, communion with Satanas and the hosts of hell, a place of dedication, solace, healing and unrestricted spiritual freedom to be yourself. Depending on what you're doing, privacy is, uh, is important. A comfortable environment is important as well. Something as simple as being outside in Florida at night, you know, mosquitoes <laughs> eating you alive. I mean, that's going to detract from what you're trying to do. Uh, the weather as well, as we were talking about earlier before the show, we had our Valpurgis knocked ritual last night on Ritual Island. And, uh, you know, the storms came through early and after they were gone, we were able to, to paddle out and, uh, you know, everything was wet, but it was real nice. So making sure that you account for those unexpected things is, is important. Also making sure that it's large enough to facilitate your needs and desires. If you are a sole practitioner, obviously a smaller space may fulfill your needs, but if you have other coven members, you'll need a, a larger space. Yeah. You know, Alistair, you mentioned the part about the importance for privacy and uh, the ability to, you know, to focus in on the rituals at hand, so on and so forth. What is some advice, maybe a little bit of advice here, because I know this is a question you get on a regular basis from people who say, look, my husband or my wife wouldn't understand, or, you know, it's dangerous in the country I live in. What, what's some advice for the selection of that temple that um, might lend an answer to some of those privacy issues? Well, there are a couple of things that a person can consider if they do live, let's say, in a household where there are people around all the time or, you know, they fear for their, their safety or there's not enough privacy. You can always consider a remote area like a park or a natural setting or something like that. Again, you... You have to make sure that you adhere to the laws. You don't want to end up in jail. That serves no purpose whatsoever. You could also consider renting a small location, conference room or something like that. If you've got a, uh, maybe two or three other people that would like to go in with you on that. If you have no privacy, then it's going to be really difficult, but always keep in mind that your mind is your temple. That's where everything begins and ends. While you may not have a physical location, the mind is really where the work takes place and the energy is built in. And obviously think of the astral nature, for example, so while having a physical space is good for some people, other people really don't even feel a need to have that particular space. In fact, 
there are many Satanists, and I'm referring to devil worshipers in this context, that don't do ritual at all. They go into communion with Satanas. They do it all through the mind and through the spirit and the, the body, but they don't do elaborate rituals, and that's just fine. If that is what satisfies the person, there's nothing that absolutely says you must do rituals in order to be a devil worshiper. That's great. Alistair, that's exactly what I was looking for, and thanks for sharing that. Sig, how about for you? What sort of things did you look for in the selection of his temple, and what are some elements you find important in that selection process? On that personal relationship with Satanas, and it's so very personal and unique for each and every one of us, and um, as we are on that journey, we also can find ourselves evolving and deepening our relationship with Satanas. So different practices I have found in my journey I have resonated with in different points in my life. And each time that I went through different practices, there was a meaning for that as well. I mean, simply put, at one point, um, the ceremonial uh, ritual was very meaningful for me, and it still is. And that's my particular maybe personality type. I enjoy the theatrics, the psychopomp, I eat, um, the environmental setup, the elements of the incense, and the candles, perhaps I'm a romantic. And, um, and it all just helps the mind get to that place where over a period of time, you, you find that and within yourself. And before you know it, years pass on and just a scent of an incense might just automatically put you straight in that magical zone where you're, you feel it, you're, you're shifted, you're, you're deepening your meditative mind you're going within and of course there was the luxury of having that ritual space you know a room or a closet or a place in, uh, to the side in the bedroom that was only for that where you had a little altar set up strictly for that and perhaps you would light a candle or had a statue of baphomet or some people put a bowl of water or flowers or any type of offering for that matter um, that's that conveys the meaning in that personal relationship and then sometimes maybe you're moving and you catch yourself a little transient, you're changing homes, residences, and you might not have that luxury, but you could still have that personal relationship with Satanas. So you might revert back to the more m mindful or meditative or mentalism in connecting with Satanas. Perhaps there's people around that you don't have the luxury to be in a space. However, you like Magus Alistair said, you have your mind. It begins there and it ends there. And I'd like to note that as mentioned in one of Alistair's videos and here with each other, we've talked about meaning. Meaning is so important. Where there is meaning, there is power. If it means nothing to you, then perhaps that poses a question for you to ask yourself, what am I doing? Is this really for me? But for me, uh, these days, um, I have practiced the A to Z from what I've just mentioned, depending on different settings, different purposes. In a ceremonial setting, I do like to have a, an icon also in place. I, um, maybe it's an inverted cross or a Baphomet and, um, and some other element. Thanks, Cygnus. You know, one of the things that I've always appreciated about you is your sincerity and your authenticity in your worship of Satanas. And so let me go back to you for a follow-up question. You know, like me, your temple and your altar space has morphed a couple of times. And I love the quote uh, from you from our last show, something to the effect uh, that you had been in a temple that was as dark as dark with all the right aesthetics and it was dead. Talk to us about what you meant by that. You know, there's, there's nothing like experience, right? Living life and uh, living life on your terms and, um, and through experience, gaining wisdom. And perhaps that's through trial and error, pain and pleasure. 
but it's your journey to walk. And um, so as I've gone on this journey, many times you want to learn new things, try something out or meet new people and you, or you meet new groups and you're learning, right? You're learning, you're trying, you're, you're experiencing. And I'm hopeful that through that process, you're gaining wisdom also what works for you. So there's been settings in the past where it was impressive, uh, the aesthetics of it, the, the maybe perhaps the people, there was a lot of people, impressive, right? So it looks like there's something going on and everything is there. It seems like, wow, this is it. This is the place where something is going to go down. And then perhaps you're there and you realize, I guess the grass wasn't really greener on the other side. And, and perhaps that itch wasn't really scratched. That was kind of the experience for me. In other words, I've been in places where, and this is not a judgment on anyone else, I, I respect everyone's journey. And perhaps for those people, it was meaningful for them. And I honor that. And looking back in my journey, uh, it all led me to where I am today. Similar to the expression of all roads lead back to Rome. And I have found that with Satanas. Once I found my home with him, I was completely satiated. My, I thirst no more. And therein I knew that he was indeed and still is and shall remain forever the prince of truth and lies, so to speak. Meaning is very powerful, as Alistair has mentioned in his previous video, where it is meaningful for you. And I think that's that black diamond that we're all in search of. Perhaps it is maybe the philosopher's stone. And you can be around all the, the right people on paper, and um, but it might just not be your place. And the irony is, your place might just very well be in the solitary chambers of your own mind right before that altar of perdition of Satanas himself. Thanks, Sig. That was very good as always. Alistair, you've been my longest serving mentor, so to speak, uh, the one I've been the longest with. I think of mentors in my journey, Satanic journey, as being um, folks that kind of push the canoe off the side of the bank and move me to a different level and you've certainly been that for me. But one of my previous mentors that I had once said, don't share the details about your temple with anyone unless in a coven situation, the space is unique to you and Satanas. The inference I took at the time was that the statement meant, don't reveal those things that should remain occult or hidden. Now, I've come to think that that observation was more intimate than that. And I'd like to know any thoughts from you um, on that teaching. Well, I think for each practitioner, some things will always be left unsaid uh, as desired. There are intimate details of each person's practice as a sole practitioner and also in a coven setting as well. There's nothing wrong with discussing your temple discussing the implements, but there are some things that are personal and, and are not meant for public consumption. I guess it, it boils down to personal preference, but also remember discretion is required for other coven members. So certain things may be done within the ritual chamber that again are very intimate and those experiences belong to the individual. So a person, uh, even a, a, another coven member, really doesn't have the right to discuss those things without the benefit of uh, the other person giving permission. A cult is, is covert by its very nature, and obviously life happens in private, and some things will never be revealed or shared outside the circle. I think, again, it, it comes down to personal preference. For a sole practitioner, that is really up to them. Great. Thanks, Alistair. Sig, any additional thoughts here from you about the statement? that I posed to Alistair or any other observations about the temple space? I do personally um, value the, the principle of silence, to be silent. And um, I think one of the first books I ever read on this path years ago spoke of that even in the first chapter. And to this day, I hold that principle to be very true. Yet it's 
more profound than also what it seems, and it speaks to many things. That devotional space is very personal. And, and like in anyone's personal life, I don't think we would go around just telling anybody our business and putting it out there, or it's, it might be a little TMI even, just simply put, as a, demystifying the whole thing for a moment. But more than that, yes, it's also deeply meaningful and sacred and unique to you, to the individual. So I think being very selective to what you say, to who, what you choose to disclose um, this is a very intimate part of you. The elements on the altar often speak to very core aspects of your spirit. And sometimes you will see this like in voodoo altars. They, it's very, it could be in so many items. And, and if you walk into one of those shops and many things are, are hanging and hanging and dangling and everything has a story, a meaning. And um, so it's very unique to the individual soul and spirit and to that journey. So I would always, you know, recommend discretion and um, being selective um, to who you choose to share what. Of course, if you're a member of a coven and integrity is a valuable principle, if you, um, like any friend, if a friend discloses something personal to you, of course, you don't go around and just tell everybody if you're a true friend. Um, similarly, there are things that stay within friends. And if you're a soul practitioner, then um, be selective also who and what you share, um, because that's intimate to you. And many times we do that in different times in our journey, because perhaps when like, for example, maybe if you just started the path, you're looking to connect, you're looking to make friends, you're looking for a sense of community. And, and then perhaps as Winston Churchill said, um, when I was 20, I cared what everyone thought. When I was 40, I stopped caring what everyone thought. And then when I was 60, nobody was really thinking about me to begin with. I'll end with that. Thanks, Cygnus. Great observation. Hey, Alistair, what about the altar? Does it select you or do you select it? In other words, how much of it is Satan leading you to something that is appropriate? I think that prayer and meditation are required in all areas of your life, and the altar is, is no different. The altar is a personal thing. It's aesthetic. It's thought-provoking. It's reflective. It's highly individualistic. I think what makes up the altar is, is really less important than the connection between you and the altar and the implements. When you look at your altar, you should see the touch of Satan in all the implements. That's, to me, what yields the biggest return. It's, it's more than just inanimate objects or a, a table or what have you. It becomes a part of you. And I think the things that are on the altar, around the altar, or the altar itself, the guidance comes from the ultimate counselor, Satanas. Yeah, I think that's right. You know, I, I, for my first altar, it was very basic and very simple. And then I found this really incredible antique that I should not have been able to afford. And what attracted me to it was that it was a 1890s French style and it had these arching sides to it that look like demonic wings then it had characters that clearly had that kind of uh, gargoyle look to them built into carved into the wood i should not have been able to afford this thing it was on ebay it was a couple of hundred bucks i was flabbergasted and i think it was one of those 2 a.m purchases that had to be shipped from another <laughs> state. And I thought, you know, there's, there's no way I could have manufactured this. I couldn't have found it. I couldn't have, I could, I could have searched the internet for hours. And this thing I just stumbled upon, I shouldn't right. have been able to afford it. It shouldn't have come in one piece when it got to me. It had a couple of marble pieces that went with it. This thing got shipped in some, in the back of somebody's truck for probably about a 10 hour journey. And it came in one piece and fit perfectly. And I have never, ever looked back and said, why did I buy that? Because it was clearly chosen. It was the right piece. It speaks to me every time I'm before it. But you know what? It doesn't have to be elaborate. It can be no, simple. It can absolutely. be the most simple thing. 
Oh, absolutely. I have people who have told me they found their altar at like flea markets. You know, they would, they would find something and most people that were there shopping would not want this piece in their home, but for a Satanist, it, it was perfect. Kind of like what you explained. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's right. And I think it, I think, as you said, it, it does, you know, it kind of speaks to you and it, you know, who it's coming from. Right. So Sig, how about for you? Any, any thoughts here about an altar selection? You know, I've used different types of altars from nature itself, just um, very indigenous like out in the woods, you know, just kind of working from the ground up stone or a piece of wood, anything that just really was balanced just to keep candles burning or enough so that it wouldn't fall over to, you know, more elaborate altars um, with specific dimensions made of wood and cedar. And also there's the idea of carving also your own altars from wood and building it yourself with your hands. I always find that that's a very um, meaningful way of creating elements for your altar, including the altar itself, craft working, doing it actually with your hand, wood carving, carving your own wands, carving your own pentacles, building your own icons, carving it out of wood, and picking the right woods and, um, and building things. And you can do all sorts of artistic and meaningful things. These days, I just use what I have in my hands. Really, I honestly am not too attached anymore to items per se. I'll, I'll enjoy it. Don't get me wrong. It's a beautiful luxury. And I, I do have allocated space. But at the same time, uh, sometimes I'm sky clad and I go out into nature or the woods and I'm with nothing bare. Hope no one's looking at me, peeping through the leaves or something. But uh, <laughs> that was a joke, by the way. <laughs> but I, I do like to remind myself of the concept that I'm born with nothing and I'll probably end up leaving this place and going to the great beyond with nothing. So everything that I have in between is just a, a blessing and a luxury and I'm, and I'm grateful for it. Thanks, Cygnus. Um, let me ask you a follow-up here. You know, some Satanists are very reverent about their altar space, and I think that's a good concept to live by. You know, but I'm talking about in terms of keeping it clean. I, for one, clean up after every ritual, but I've been known to keep some offerings in place for a few days as a way of honoring Satanas and those demons uh, that I'm working with before disposing of the, of the remnants of the offering. How about for you, any personal thoughts about that practice? I, you know, I, I think that's a beautiful uh, practice that cultivates devotion and, um, and love for the entity. And sometimes people feel that the entity that they have a relationship with is maybe you know, asking for maybe um, something in particular or whatnot. My only thing that I have um, encountered in my personal experience was just perishable items. At one point, I think I was leaving it too long and I realized there was one day I went by and there was, uh, you know, flies and things of that nature. And it wasn't the Lord of the Flies. It was just that it was um, decomposing, maybe. <laughs> so, uh, but I think hygiene is very important. I, uh, I think keeping your altar space is very clean. Uh, is a good practice. I think it cultivates um, order and um, discipline. And, and I think you just got to honor the place that where you're at in your journey and just be open that that could change. Also, in my personal experience, uh, my altar room at one point looked maybe like a voodoo den. And I think um, these days you might think I'm more of a minimalist. So I've noticed that. And, um, and, I, and I've honored that expression of my practice over the years that, um, that it's changed. And, and I'm okay with that. Yeah, absolutely, Cygnus. Thanks. Those are some really great thoughts there. Uh, Alistair, how about for you? What are some general practices for working around the altar that you observe? Well, my personal preference is to keep the space tidy and uncluttered. My personal altar constantly evolves. So some things are added, some things are removed. Uh, some things that I'm working with for particular rituals will be put there and left for the duration, like if it's a series of rites or rituals that I'm performing. But for the most part, I like to keep it tidy to prevent 
stagnation. Sometimes I will discard everything and begin anew as, as a direct result of an answer received. This helps to prevent rituals from becoming rote dogma or prevent a feeling of being in a rut. For me, clearing those items out from time to time, it really makes a connection with me and it keeps things fresh. Thanks, Alistair. Great thoughts as always. Alistair, let's start with you as we delve into our discussion about altar to, uh, tools. Um, so as you taught me, we have our athame, we have our chalice, we have our incense and our incense holder, we have our candle holder or holders, we have our candle snifter, because as you have said, no uh, satanic priest would be left without one. We have our candles, of course, we have our offering bowl, we have our ritual bell or gong. Uh, of course, there is the grimoire, and many of us have a central focus to him that Cygnus has mentioned, which could be our pentagram, reverse cross, or a baphomet, something that reminds us of Satanas during our ritual. There are certainly things that can be added here, such as a black mirror that you might use for scrying from time to time, but am I missing anything major from the list? No, I think that about covers it. Unless you're doing a special ritual or a rite where you may bring in another specific implement, I think you've got it covered. So of all the elements listed here, is there something that has to be made of silver or some special wood or a blade sharpened on one end versus the other in a certain direction, for instance? Any special requirements along those lines? No, not really. I believe most of the so-called requirements, they're, they're really preference. I have certain preferences for certain implements that are certain designs or what have you, but it's not a requirement. In other words, a person's magic will be just as effective if they cannot afford a silver chalice wood or plastic is perfectly acceptable. The, the intention of the practitioner is more important than the raw materials of the implements. And that is really what is recognized by those that you call upon. For the practitioner, it would be very easy to fall into dogma if things must be a certain way and made of a certain substance and recited a certain way. Those are, are all dogma related. So no, most of those so-called requirements, they're just really a preference. Yeah, I think that's spot on and I appreciate your, your thoughts there. So if I hear what you're saying, just to capsulize it, certainly there might be something here in the tools that you find personally uh, valuable. You may believe that out of respect for Satanas, that it is imperative that you purchase a silver chalice because that's right for you. And you want to honor that relationship. And therefore, in your practice, that may strengthen your result and your resolve because you're following through with the feelings on the matter. And so I think that's absolutely right. Sig, any other thoughts here on this issue in um, speaking to our audience about the personal practice? No, I think uh, Magus Alistair really um, touched it. It was um, on point with everything. Um, what does come to mind, I think, as Alistair mentioned, and we've talked about many times, is intention and sincerity, authenticity of passion in your practice, truly passion. Um, there's been times where in constructing um, items myself, I'm a bit of a wood carver. I like to, I'm an arts and crafts, crafts type of guy. So I, I remember many times building my own, you know, carving my own chalices or pentacles with my own hands. And in the process, I would accidentally like nick my fingers or get a splinter. And, and so the, the instruments themselves were covered with my sweat. They were covered with like little pricks of my blood. It just made it so much more meaningful because there was intention there. It took me maybe a day or two to, of dedication, just sitting before the altar, carving, carving. And I was, I would maybe carve it out and I would be chanting the whole time. 
So, you know, there's energy there, there's intention there. And so I always found that to be very meaningful for me. And if you're not, if a person's not inclined that way, that's okay too. Um, but meaning, meaning is so important. So, but I do recommend if you were to acquire an object, make it yours. Uh, Magus Alistair and in books, we, there's rituals for that to, to cleanse and to consecrate items. Um, make it yours though, make it yours. Cleanse it, bless it, consecrate it to Satanas for, for use. And um, so that when you see your altar, it's not just uh, like an arbitrary thing outside of you that's just kind of sitting there, but that it's an extension of you. And, um, and that's what these elements are for me. When I hold the athami or the wand, um, it's an extension of me. And um, although there's properties that can be very meaningful, that it has a tradition or a story to it. So but let it, let it be an extension of you. One thing that I've always appreciated about the satanic praxis, um, as I understand it, is that we are not dependent on the planet or the moon or instruments outside of us. We yield the intent and the meaning and the power. These things are helpful and they're blessings to have, but, the, but, but we yield it with what Magus Alistair said. It begins and ends with you. Yeah, I think that's very good, Sig. Thanks for, thanks for sharing. Next, we're going to talk about the use of each implement or altar tool, and we will all three do this in a roundtable discussion. I'm going to work us back and forth through the list. As I come to you, tell us the purpose and usage of the tool, what you should look for when selecting it for your altar. And Alistair, let's begin with you. Tell us about the Athme. What's it used for, and how should our novices go about selecting their first? The Athme is uh, a ceremonial blade. A knife or a sword can be used as well. It's used for cutting and pointing to the cardinal directions of the compass. It's used for directing and also dividing as well. The characteristics of the blade itself is really preference. It should fit in the hand comfortably. It should be easily controlled. And uh, contrary to, to what a lot of people think, the athme is not required to have a double edge blade. Again, this goes back to preference. And some people have, you know, written that this is a requirement in their, their books and literature, but I don't feel that it is. And our group has never suffered because we did not have a double edged blade. Either one is acceptable. I think, again, it goes back to preference. Great, Alistair. Thank you so much. Uh, so I'll go next. And the next um, tool that we'll talk about is chalice. So the chalice is used in ritual practice. It can be silver. It can be wood. It can be brass, for instance. I personally could not use gold or polished brass or gold plate because I was once an exeon and it reminds me too much of prior practice. For me, it would almost be dishonoring to Satanas. I prefer to use silver, as we spoke earlier, out of an honor to the relationship. I personally use red wine, although you can use your own mixture of geis. Uh, see Alistair's book on satanic practice for a geis recipe that Magnum Opus uses. In my practice, I generally use it by taking a sip at the end of a request or immediately after my expression of will, so mode it be. I also use it by taking a sip at different points when I'm honoring or giving thanks to those that I'm working with. It also can be used at the end of a segment in your ritual to close that segment off. Uh, you should use all of your wine or whatever your liquid is that you're using in your chalice by the end of the ritual or dedicate the remainder to the entity that you're working with. For the priest in satanic baptisms uh, and marriages or funerals, it is used as the sacred element of dedication, union, or the commitment of the individuals involved in the ceremony. So that's, that's how I use a chalice and use whatever liquid that I'm using in the chalice. So Sig, take us through the use and selection of the incense and the incense holder. 
in my altar space there's always something burning. Incense is very important. And I know that in, in the books of Magus Alistair, sandalwood is an incense that's a very um, pleasing, very meaningful um, incense in, in, this, in the satanic tradition. Over the years, in addition, I've also made a habit to use of frankincense and myrrh as well. But before beginning with the offerings of the incense, there's always a cleansing first that happens in the space. I'm very fond of the different sages, white sage, um, cedar is another good one. Those three often are very good for cleansing space. I've used it. I have also liked the aroma of, of cedar and Palo Santo, very similar, has a sweet sweet scent and it's very pleasing for those also that are present sage is very repugnant it can be very strong for many and some people they have allergies and be weary by the way of fire alarms uh, i've gone and carried away in the past and forgotten that there were fire alarms in my room or and in the house and um, before you know it you're in the middle of a ritual chanting away room is filling up with smoke and um, all of a sudden the fire alarm goes off neighbors are coming out and you're going to have wow. to explain yourself yeah <laughs> so you you rush over to the windows you open everything the smoke is pouring out everyone's saying is there a fire in there and you're like what are you going to say i overheated a turkey in the oven but um <laughs> but you know what you were doing <laughs> that that has happened so um and um and then when i had to leave the apartment i had to paint the apartment because the rooms were uh, charcoal and they should have been white so keep in mind that maybe you're burning a little too much, but also it might not be too healthy. Filling up a room was too, too much smoke. I was, very, I was a fan of having a cauldron because I would burn a lot of incense in the cauldron. And so I'm part of spell crafting or even just as an offering, you know, something beautiful um, for health and for, for abundance, whatever it is, and, and offering that in your devotion. So uh, a cauldron is another key element for me as well. And different types of incense is good. You know, you can have your incense sticks, which really work well. And there's different brands. Some are lower quality. Some are better quality, depending on your budget. And then you can um, order the rock, the, the organic incense. And um, I've offered a couple of times, someone has gifted it to the, to the temple. So I'm straight from Oman, straight from the Middle East. And that was, uh, that was really beautiful. Um, because it had a really pure, pure scent to it. As mentioned, dragon's blood is one that many people like to use for satanas. Um, frankincense has a purification to it. Um, myrrh has similar um, properties to frankincense. One combination that I like with frankincense and myrrh, because so they say, and I can't tell you right now at the top of my head which book or grimoire out there, but the combination of the two is favorable for the messengers between the worlds thins the veil. So frankincense and myrrh has been a common combination. Copal, like a resin, uh, dragon's blood, we mentioned cedar, uh, sandalwood. And there's others as well. There's many other herbs that you can burn and um, that can be helpful. There's a lot of like starter kits, by the way, for those that want to sample different amount of different herbs or incense on an Amazon. You can certainly find something that's affordable where you could uh, order a sample pack of many and go through them and, and see what you like. Hey, thank you, Cygnus. That was great. What a great rundown um, of options. And, and I think you hit upon it very well. And that is, you know, try it. Sample, sample what you think is right. Not everyone has the same result. Again, it's back to our whole discussion about individualistic practice. Uh, so thank you, my brother. Alistair, why don't you take offering bowl uh, and talk to us briefly about what are proper and, and or appropriate offerings? For an offering, uh, they can be many different things. In some practices, people will use maybe a spot of their own blood on parchment paper. They may use food items, fruit, altar cakes. They may even burn sigils as part of the ceremony that would be part of their burnt offering to the entity. So really, it, it depends on what spirit or deity you're working with as to what you're offering. Offering is, is something that you give out of abundance I think the most effective offerings are those that are very similar to sacrifice because it's something that is of value to you. So in other words, if 
you have a limited quantity or a limited supply of whatever it is that you're offering, especially if you're sacrificing, that means a lot more than if you have this huge surplus and it really does not engage you emotionally to give that away. Yeah, I think that's very, uh, very well said. You know, I remember at one point I was asking you about blood offerings because at a very early age, trying to figure all this out. And you said, look, you just need to give enough, you know, which can be one pinprick. It's sufficient. I do use sigils in my offerings and generally use a pinprick. I use a diabetics uh, prick kit and a blood spot on each corner of the sigil. You know, there are effective ways to do it. Um, and this whole idea of, you know, baby sacrifice and animal ritualistic killings and all that, you know, that's a Hollywood slash uh, satanic panic uh, makeup of, um, of ritual practice. Yeah. Alistair, you want to say anything else about that? Yeah, absolutely. That, that kind of stuff is uh, bullshit. Absolutely. Uh, most of that was developed over the years by established religions to demonize the worship of anything other than their deity. And as far as sacrificing an animal or another human or, or what have you, those concepts really have no place in our journey, especially the, the sacrifice of an animal. That is more of established religion, uh, especially Jewish beliefs, uh, sacrificing the, uh, the lamb and things like that. Uh, it really has no place in what we're doing. And as a sacrifice, an offering or sacrifice, that would mean absolutely nothing to Satanas. In fact, quite the opposite, because whatever you are are killing does not hold a true emotional value to you and does not cause you to suffer with the loss of that particular thing, then it's non-effective. Uh, some people will ask, well, what could I sacrifice to Satan that he would recognize? You know, it's cliche, but sacrifice with your time, with your money, those are the things that cost you directly. Those are the things that you have in limited supply. And when you give those things, that means more because they are really connecting with you and your spirit and allowing you to connect to the deity itself. Always well said. So I'll take candles and candle holders. Um, I personally use silver candle holders. Again, I do that out of respect. I use mainly black candles, specifically for working with Satanas and other demons of the cardinal compass. But I've also been known to use red and yellow. For me in my practice, these are used in ritual and prayer only, and they denote his presence. I light them at the beginning of my ritual after clearing uh, the space using my ritual bell, I use a candle snifter to uh, put the candles out. <laughs> Alistair Nott has said, no respectful satanic witch would be without one. This is done at the end of my ritual and it denotes his departure. And I put them out after I bid Satan good departure with my blessings and thanks. A note to those whitewashed tombs out there who believe somehow by keeping black candles off the market, this will somehow stop satanic practice. You have absolutely no fucking idea what you're talking about. You have no power to stop his practice and his worship. Uh, the color is about honoring him. It sets the mood and the tone. And if all of the black candles tomorrow were gone, there would still be satanic ritual and satanic worship. 
Absolutely well said. As you and I have discussed before, I guess there are religious groups that believe that they can prevent satanic rituals or, or what have you by removing a certain color wax from the market. And that is just bogus. Absolutely. So Alistair, how about the ritual bell or gong? Why don't you take the lead on that one? Well, the ritual bell itself or gong, either, either one, is used to begin the ritual, to call the ritual to order, and also to adjourn the ritual. Also, it's used at certain points throughout the ritual to kind of denote moving from one phase of the ritual to the other. And usually it comes at the end of a certain recitation. So if you have a ritual where maybe your high priest is uh, giving a dedication or something to that effect, at the end of that, the group may chime in together, so mote it be, and then the bell would be struck a certain number of times. It really comes from back in the, the olden days, uh, where witches, when they had their coven meetings, they would leave these little hamlets and they would go out into the woods and they would strike the bell or whatever they had a certain number of times with a clapper. And that would signal the people around in the different little villages that it was time to gather. And so it, it was in essence, like a school bell, so to speak, to call those, those uh, witches together. And so it's a holdover from that. And it also, as a mechanical means, it helps to clear the air in the ritual chamber as well. Obviously breaking up any residual sounds or harmonic vibrations allows you to make those anew and to use those for benefit during your ritual. And so those are the ways that they are used in, in our practice. Yeah, I think that's, that's absolutely what I would say. The only, the only thing I would add to it is that I, I see it almost like clearing the aura space. Like it not only sets the tone for the start, but it like cleanses the aura to begin the process of being focused on satanic thought and satanic worship. And do you have any thoughts on that statement? I absolutely agree with that. There are low frequency oscillations that happen all the time. And obviously we know that the human hearing spectrum is very limited. In other words, uh, you know, there are sounds at very, very low frequencies and very, very high frequencies that we cannot hear. The bell itself, the, the sound itself may be at a certain frequency, but the vibration goes across mm. the frequency spectrum. And it does exactly that. It zeroes that out where those oscillations are not happening anymore. Obviously, again, as animals, dogs, they can hear things much, much higher that we cannot even perceive. And so by using the bell, it, it does the same thing. It clears the temple. And as you say, it, it kind of sets the aura or it resets all of that harmonic within the temple. Yeah, absolutely. That's a, that's much better said than I, than I said it. So I think, I think, right. So, um, Sig, anything to add here, um, uh, on the ritual bell or gong? Magus, you, you so nicely said that with the different frequencies, um, because that's what that reminds me of us with like the Tibet, the Tibetan singing bowl, some witches or pagans or different new age practitioners or Reiki folks would use the Tibetan singing bowl, the gong, uh, as a way of eliciting on uh, sound waves that ripple outward when that when when it is rung or when it's being sung. And you'll often hear that Tibetan singing bowl as and it just kind of um, waves out. And so I always 
side note, I like to always kind of associate an element with the ritual tools. So in this regard, for me, the bell would also represent the element of air. For some people, it could also, because of that rippling effect of the sound waves, um, represent water somewhat. But typically speaking, but it could also mean the water, the element of water. But bells, since the beginning of all religious or spiritual practices, have always been used also for as a call to devotion, as a call to prayer. And um, and so when Magus, when you mentioned the bell being rung, and uh, and I love that uh, that imagery that you painted there, and and the old witches just cut, all, all gathering upon hearing that. And this is a, a universal, I believe, a sound that's heard or used in throughout many traditions from the Tibetans, from the, from the pagans, um, to the Hindus, to, to the witches. And so the beginning and the end of prayer, a calling to come before Satanas. And in some respect, the Buddhists, I believe, would um, symbolize the sound of the bell as that of the voice of the enlightened one. So it's almost as if, in, in some respect, in my practice, if I didn't have a bell, it, it, I, my vibration, my tonal vibration can, and diaphragm can serve. It is the voice of the devotee when in that, in that place connecting to satanas. So kind of keeping that in mind, that, that power upon opening and closing with the ritual bell is very meaningful. Well said. So thanks for thanks for that. And you know, you never disappoint, brother. You always have some sage item to add, and I really appreciate it. So let's go on to grimoire, and I'll I'll take the start here, and I probably should take the start here because I will tell you that I would take a thousand pinpricks uh, in ritual um, versus having to write in my grimoire at the end of the evening because I. I almost initially found it as torture. When Alistair talked about, when we were doing our training, talked about how important it was, I was like, gosh, to have to sit down and write after you finish coming out of a ritual. Because for one thing, you're tired. You know, oh, yeah. you're so tired. But he is spot on about it. And I'm going to share with you a couple of reasons as to why he's spot on about it. For a number of months initially, I did not do it. I would not write it because I just, I was too tired. I felt like, what am I going to get from this? It's like writing a diary. Why do I want to do this? And then one night, for some reason, I wrote and I just wrote and wrote and wrote. And then a couple of, couple of days later, same thing, ritual. And I wrote and I wrote and I wrote. And then about a month passed and I was still doing some writing, but it was off and on. And I, I go back to my grimoire and I read this entry from about two months earlier. And I was blown away because it pointed to the gnosis that I was looking for, but it set the time frame for me to understand how much growth had occurred so that I could see that the gnosis was occurring. It established a framework to be able to see that. The second thing it did was it made me realize things that I had forgotten in the ritual as they were done, and it helps you perfect, and it helps you grow, and do not underestimate the impact that the grimoire has. It has a tremendous impact. In fact, I'll just, I'll throw this out here. You're missing half of what you're learning if you don't do it. And Alistair, I'll just turn this over to you, and you may want to add the ends part that, that you so effectively do. Sure. Before I do that, one of the things you said is, is so important as a takeaway. What you're looking for, if, if you're looking for an answer, if you have asked for an answer to something or, or certain sacred knowledge or what have you, Sometimes that information will come and you really will not even realize that it has come. And so by writing that information down, when your mind is truly ready to accept it, maybe days or weeks or months later, you're going to be able to go back and you're going to be able to pick that up and read it. And it's going to be like a light bulb coming on, but you're just not ready for it when you write it. I just wanted to point that out. Very powerful statement that you made. We may want to tell them what the grimoire is. I just realized we missed that. 
first of all, your grimoire is really your historical record. It's it's your magical recipe book. But it's more than that. It's it's also your own personal journey and your own personal journal for what you're doing along your path. Uh, some people use it exclusively for rites and rituals. Other people will only use it for personal thoughts, and then others will use it for both. I recommend that you use it especially for ritual and any magical operations. We use the ENDS, E-N-D-S acronym, which stands for Eat, Nest, Drink, and Scribe. And we use that to remind us to write in our grimoire at the end of any ceremonial magic operations. Many rituals are very long. They're very involved. Some of them are multi-day. And so they're very draining mentally and physically. And I totally relate to what you said about being tired. And, and it may seem like a drudgery. And you may actually feel that you're not getting a value while you're actually putting pen to paper, but you will look back and the value that the grimoire truly brings is it will help you in perfecting certain things. It will help you to, to use the Pareto principle to kind of separate the, the 20% that really matters and works from the 80% that is noise and superfluous aesthetics or what have you. And so by writing all of that information down, you're able to go back and discern it later. Sometimes uh, the, the message does not come directly or it doesn't come at that particular time. But because you wrote down your impressions, what went right, what did not go right, what could you do better, what were the results, then you're able to come back in retrospect and you're able to read that sometime later. It's almost like a light bulb that comes on and you get not only your answer, but you also over time begin to find what is most effective in your practice, whether it is a ritual or a rite whatever the magical operation, as you do these things over and over again, you're able to zero in on exactly what the right recipe is for you to get the desired results every time. And without having that and without acquiring and capturing and recording that knowledge, you're basically being a test subject every time you go into the sanctum, because you really have no baseline to look back at. That's great, Magnus. One of your favorite topics and one of ours to hear you talk about. This is Night Sessions coming to you from Studio 3B, talking about Satan's altar and altar tools. We are breaking for this brief commercial. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. You won't want to miss it. Hey, this is Malthorpe Draco, uh, one of your co-hosts for night sessions coming to you from Studio 3B. It's really an honor for Magister Cygnus Atratus and Magus Alistair Knott and I to do this show for you on a monthly basis. We come to you sporadically throughout the month and we try to share everything that we've learned along our journey in the path to Satanas. And we just want you to be a part of that ministry and that walk. Start your own journey, be with us uh, when we broadcast. We'd love to have the benefit of some feedback from uh, some of our listeners. So if you get a moment, just uh, send Alistair Knott an email, and Alistair's going to give you that email address right now. Alistair Knott at rocketmail.com. That's Alistair Knott at rocketmail.com. All three of us would love to hear from you, and uh, any any ideas or thoughts about future shows is a welcome addition. So please send us your emails. Let us know what you think about the show, 
and give us any thoughts and ideas. And we look forward to continue to providing this service to you on a monthly basis. Good evening and hail Satan. If you're just joining us, I'm your co-host Mel Thorpe Draco in Studio 3B, and this is Night Sessions. With me is Magus Alistair Knott and Magister Cygnus Atratus. This evening, we're talking about Satan's altar and the implements or tools used in satanic practice. Cygnus, talk to me about your preparation for ritual. What do you do personally, and what do you do to just get ready for an evening where you're going to spend time with Satan? One important element is for me is um, a ritual bath, even a ritual shower, and an intentful uh, preparation of the body before entering the altar. Different herbs could be used as well, moving through the the different chakras and the different centers. I always um, prepare the space with the cleansing, neutralizing the, the altar area and the different energies. I always like to also call it, um, do a, um, an alignment of the different centers. Some old terminology can be, can be used as like the middle pillar, ritual, different type of chantings that aligns your uh, centers, your chakras, so that your body has been prepared and your mind is being prepared. I, I do find that sometimes the ritual shower, the ritual bath is um, overlooked. And I think that's a very key component for me. Um, preparing the mind and the body, leaving, by, leaving behind the, your day, leaving behind your old life, leaving behind your physical life. And when you embark on now this ritual or your devotion, now it's um, a whole of what you are, what you think you are, what you used to be, the day, your job. For me, it's now by, it's about being reborn. But now I'm entering fresh. I'm entering clean. I'm, I'm preparing the vessel. Now, different things I might do aesthetically to prepare for different maybe intentions. Um, different folks might um, abstain from different foods. Maybe they fast potentially or the latter. They might indulge. Um, for energy building or for a ritualistic purpose. So that's something to take into consideration. Thanks, Sig. Spot on. That's, you, you've just targeted in on the things that I do as well. And Alistair, what do you have to add here? I totally agree. The important part is to get into the right frame of mind and whatever that takes that's really what you want to do. You want to you want to leave everything behind, everything secular, everything of the world, and really get prepared, mind, body, spirit for the ritual. So I agree one hundred percent. So Alistair, uh, talk to us about the cardinal compass. Uh, that's something I adopted early on in my ritual practice. And I've now memorized it uh, as taught by Magnum Opus Coven. It's become a very important part to me of my rituals. It somehow just sets the tone just right. Um, Alistair, tell us your thoughts here and how important is the cardinal compass in the ritual setting? Well, for us, it, it plays a, a very important part. As you know, we use the invocation of the cardinal compass. And so what we're doing is we're going to each of the four stations or four directions of the compass, uh, the north, south, east, and west. We begin by facing the altar, and then we call upon the deity at each of the compass directions uh, corresponding to those points. And we have certain depending on the rituals, certain recitations that we will do. And then we'll also perform certain actions at those points as well. For example, uh, using an athame or the sword, as we're going through each of the stations, we will be drawing the pentagram and a circle with the athame at each one of those. As again, we're reciting whatever it is that we're either uh, doing or calling upon. And we usually plan that before the ritual or the rite. So like, for example, we may begin facing the altar 
And we might recite uh, something like, Satanas, Lord of the earth, grant my unholy desires. As we're reciting that actual passage, we would draw the pentagram and then stab the center of the pentagram as we vibrate the name of the entity for which we're calling across the astral. When we do this, we're calling for the entity to actually come and join us in our satanic temple. Man, that was great. Sig, how about for you? Is there an important element that you include in every ritual that has been meaningful for you? Oh, absolutely. For me, the an important part of my ritual always is fire. It symbolizes perhaps one of the oldest magical or shamanic rituals, you know, even found in the earliest of caves um, from like ancient man you, um, depictions dancing around the fire. Um, to have a fire burning, even if it's a candle, a small little candle would do. Uh, the element of fire. Um, and I, I believe also even in, in the myths of creation, uh, where air and fire met, those two were the primordial elements, along with um, earth and water. Nonetheless, it, it reminds me of the fiat lux, but how my practice represents also the fiat of the nox, let there be night. And so with fire, uh, it uh, illuminates it represents, it represents also the illuminating um, light of Satanas, you know, of Lucifer. So the fire itself is an ancient, uh, although simple. If you look at many cultures, even going back to Siberian shamanism, um, the fire rituals and the celebration of fire. So to have a fire burning before you, a cauldron, a candle, you know, reminds me also of the the ancient Zoroastrian sorcerers of Achiman, you know, um, with the fire that was always burning. You know, for me, this is symbolic also of the fire of Satanas. Always upon the altar, there is a fire that is burning. You know, symbolic of that. Some practitioners might just leave a candle always on. You'll always find that on altar. Some folks will leave a candle always lit, um, you know, symbolizing, uh, again, maybe an offering to Satanas. Some people see it more literally, like they're offering an actual something to the entity. And um, like um, more like what the entity would kind of uh, use the candle energy. Um, but in, in this respect, it's, it's deeper than that for me. It, it, it represents the, the fire of Satanas before his altar uh, perdition, I like to call it. That's where I lose myself and I am reborn in him. So um, fire, definitely. Thanks, Sig. I like that a lot. So, Alistair, as a teacher of the satanic arts, give us the elements of a standard ritual, the parts that you believe are important in the practice. So, for magnum opus, the long form ritual contains uh, these particular phases. So, you have the opening. And we've kind of discussed the, the ringing of the bell and the so-called calling to order. We have the clearing, which is the clearing of your temple. It's um, kind of synonymous with uh, cleaning of the air, uh, clearing of any negative energies, clearing of what has happened today, earlier, um, what has happened previously in your life up until this point is all cleared. The dedication is usually the opening and the, the dedication of oneself, physical and spirit, to Satanas. The incantation and the charge kind of work together. The incantation itself is usually something that is very meaningful to the practitioner um, to actually state. So along with the dedication, this might be a time when you are preparing to give the offering of blood or, or what have you at this point. 
The charge is usually to ground yourself, metaphorically speaking, to make sure that, again, your chakras are open, the energy is flowing, the breathing in through the nose and out through the mouth, entering the meditative state. You're usually asking for a blessing of some sort, or you're asking what your will is, kind of what the vehicle of the ritual is. What is the request and what would the blessing actually be? And then the benediction is as you're getting ready to actually close the ritual, you're kind of uh, putting a nice bow on it, so to speak. And that can be your closing prayer, uh, your dedication prayer, or what have you. Um, you've closed the, the circle at the beginning, and now you're kind of opening the circle as you go into the closing. Once again, ringing of the bell and uh, an adjournment of the ritual. Out of those, the, the minimum is the opening um, usually the clearing and charge, and then, uh, you know, whatever the blessing is followed by the closing. Well, wow. Alistair, that was wonderful. Thank you. Sig, anything to add here? I know I'll rest with that brother. Okay, great. So, you know, yeah, I'll just say this about ritual. You get out what you put in. If you focus on him and you direct your energy towards him and you open yourself and you give yourself freely, he arrives, he stays, he delivers. It may not be within the time that you think it's going to be, but it's real and there is no disappointment. That's the whole reason why we as his priests stay in this, because there's never a disappointment. So thank you both. Uh, let's move on to our final question. Cygnus, let's start with you. So satanic ritual and practice may not be for every Satanist. Do you, you actually said this at the beginning. Do you agree with that statement? And in answering the question, tell us what it has done for you as which ritual brought you closer to Satanas in the process. Hey, this is a very personal relationship right? And personal relationship with Satanas. And as Magus Alistair has said on so many occasions, Satanas is, um, is welcoming of you to come before his altar. And oh, I would also like to add that this is a path, as mentioned before, that requires devotion, dedication, work, and um, and so it does ask of the seeker something more than just riding in the back seat. It asks of you to really fully be involved in this process. So I would, it does encourage the individual to do that. And so I would say that up front to, to the person that is seeking to go down this path, be willing to be involved in this work. Um, this is a work that requires a full, a full attention of your senses, of your body, of your mind, and of your soul, if you, and of, your, of, of everything that you are. And um, so really be honest with yourself when asking yourself the question, is this path for me? As for myself, this um, path has, um, has change me forever and I'm no longer the man I I was I no longer the man I am and it is what I will become in him and if I may add the black mass or the rituals the devotions we offer that I offer I shall sing this song of the devil and in offering and in praise and I shall offer in gratitude, sincerity, and authenticity a true devotion of my beating heart. Both chalice and sword present, phallus and womb, fire and smoke, wine and graves, the wand directing the will of the sorcerer, 
magician and witch, trance and vibrations, bells, ether, semen, blood, sweat, and hair, all etheric and primal elements present as needed and as moved by the practitioner. Satanasini and I am in him, and together we are one. Well, thank you, Cygnus. Uh, Alistair, how about for you? Has ritual practice brought you closer in relationship with Satanas? And do you believe that that satanic ritual is optional or needed by each of us on this journey? What are your thoughts here? I believe it's optional. Um, I, I think it really is a preference for spiritual fulfillment for the practitioner. Um, I, I know devil worshipers who do not perform any rituals whatsoever. They feel totally fulfilled. They're, they're totally comfortable with that. They don't feel a need for the drawing of the circle and, and they're just fine with it. What I would say is I would recommend that a person new to this path at least try it to know, is that something that you want to do? But not everyone absolutely has to do it. I mean, there's, there's nothing mandatory that requires it in our, our daily walk, but try it and see if ritual and and ceremonial work is something that that brings you as a practitioner closer to satanas that that would be the advice that i would give you know for me i think i think what you just said resonates quite a bit you know as much as i believe in ritual as much as i feel the important significance that it has been in my life I can see where for some, and I've known some teachers, some incredible teachers that don't use ritual in the sense of the organized ritual that I'm talking about. They don't use it. Now they do do prayer and they do engage in talking to Satanas in a very real and direct and effective way. And there's one person I'm thinking of right now that, um, that comes to mind, but it's meant a tremendous amount to me personally. And I would want those that are open to it to at least experience it, as you said, Alistair, to know whether or not it's right, whether or not it, it makes sense for them. And, um, and if not, as we said at the very beginning of the show, take what's useful to you and leave the rest for another day. So gentlemen, to follow up with both of you, what's the most important message from him that you want to send to our listeners that may be gnosis for many about the use of an altar in the worship of Satan. Alistair, let's start with you and then we'll move to Cygnus. The, the most important message I feel is the important element of connection and interaction with Satanas. Those, those are the most important elements of anything that we have discussed tonight. Without those elements, everything else is meaningless and empty as, as far as I'm concerned. The, the same holds true for those that are on the left-hand path, but are of different beliefs or non-beliefs, such as an atheist performing a ritual it is entertainment to them. There's no spiritual connection because they do not believe in that spirit of Satanas. So I would say that's probably the, the most important part. And the intention of the practitioner is what's really needed because just as, as fire forges steel, we're tried by fire, and that fire ultimately consumes all things that do not have substance and meaning. And without the intention, then those things are just that, 
their theater, their aesthetics, their show, entertainment, but they are not a true connection or an interaction with him. Well said. Sig, how about for you? You know, that's hard to follow. Magus is always uh, very profound and I think touches off those points. But what I would like to share is more of a calling, a calling of remembrance for those that are listening to this podcast who are contemplating, is this path for me? The devil awaits your return back to your abysmal abode. The devil calls his children. Hear his call beckoning on your minds and hearts door. Return, remember, recall, speak from thy lips, thy power, and thy word, the name of the abysmal aeon, Satanas, 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 Ave Satanas. I guess I would end with this, ye who seek his eye and seek his ear, seek first to hear from him, open your mind, open your thoughts, open your ears, open your soul, open your heart, listen for his voice. He comes forth and gives to those that give and those that are open to hear his message. Be not the one who seeks great favor and knows not to listen first. Let those be his words. Gentlemen, that's a wrap. Thank you both for being here and for what you do in the service to him. To our studio audience, this has been Night Sessions. We will be back with you in May. Watch for announcements. Until then, on behalf of my co-host, Pleasant dreams and hail Satan. Hail Satan. Hail Satan. I call out to thee, O dark divine of my own centricity. Thou hast inflamed me in thy true love. Rouse my black flame and inspire this devotion and offering unto thee. Know thyself and know that the infernal Lord hath set apart those that are truly devoted for himself. The devil will hear when they call unto him. They will see him, and he will see them. Stand empowered and confront thy own ignorance. Commune with thy inner diamond, and be still in the silence of thy blackened heart. Selah. Offer thy sacrifices of true devotion, and put thy magic and gnosis in thy dark lord. There may be many that doubt and question, who am I? O oh, Father, ignite thy black light of thy arcane wisdom upon us, and deify our mundane nature. Thou hast fulfilled true devotion and illumination in my heart, more than in the time that the profane have squandered their sleeping potential. I will indeed live, thrive, die, and be reborn in dark solace and contemplation. For thou, O oh, infernal Lord, hast established the Sanctum Sanctorum on the cornerstone of true satanic devotion. Nee.